Hey, everybody. Welcome to this month's Don't Get Rusty uh, here from AOPA and our You Can Fly AOPA Foundation. Um, this is Bundle Your Procedures with Flow, brought to you by Progressive. I mean, no, it's uh, somebody else. But anyway, Bundle Your Procedures with Flow. So we're really glad you're all here. Um, and one quick announcement. We know that you guys are all big fans of Pablo. Unfortunately, um, you might see that in the chat, too, that he had some uh, unexpected dental work that had to be done. And he just is not. It's, he's dying, trust me, in the sense of wanting to be here, but he's just not able to talk today. So he will definitely be back. We're planning on having him back, as always, next time, uh, just in a few weeks. So uh, anyway, keep him in your thoughts and let's go ahead. Bundle your procedures with flow. So if it'll click, there it goes. Uh, just a couple of items to get started. Of course, we want to always thank our sponsors, uh, Jeppesen, Flight, and Boeing, basically all the same company, but we appreciate their support uh, and uh, all the good products that they provide. A couple quick uh, house, uh, what do we call this? Housekeeping things, I guess. Uh, for your attendee control panel, if you are using a computer, you'll see that over here, um, and you wanna ask questions, you'll see the little question, it looks like a little like cartoon bubble with the question mark in it, click on that, and that is where you would ask your questions and make sure you hit the send button right down below here, see that blue button. If you're using a tablet, iPad or some other sort of tablet, um, then the question is right up in here. It's kind of grayed out, but it's you see that little question thing. It'll pop up a little window. Type your question. Make sure you hit send. Uh, and then we have an admin panel that shows us all those questions that come in and what time they were sent. So if you have any questions, we would love to hear them. Uh, and yes, uh, we see you there, Steve. Poor Pablo, I know. We miss him too. He, trust me, it was literally touch and go up till just before, like an hour or two ago. And we were like, can you think you can do it? And he's just like, it's just hurting. So um, yeah, he'll, he'll be back though. No worries. Um, quick intros. My name's Chris Moser. So I'm uh, sort of acting as your default Pablo slash me today. Um, I, I am AOPA Senior Director of Flight Training Education. I work with CFIs and, and uh, flight schools and some of our other publications like uh, Flight School Connector and our Flight Training Experience Survey and Awards. Of course, as always, we have with us Stephen. Say hello, Stephen. Uh, hello, Stephen. <laughs> and Stephen, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself really quick? <laughs> so I'm a coordinator for our Flight Training Initiative. I work with Chris directly. Uh, also, I'm managing the, the program for the Flight Training Experience Survey, uh, working on our AFTA software. Check it out in the background as much as possible and uh, helping to support the team any way I can. Yeah, and speaking of AFTA, I'll have to make sure I mention that. Remind me to mention that during the presentation because it will be quite applicable today. And today, filling in uh, for Pablo, our special guest and our boss, so we have to be on our good behavior, um, is Dan Justman. So, Dan, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, hey, folks, Dan Justman. Uh, I've got the privilege of uh, really serving and supporting this flight training initiative team um, with Chris and Pablo and Stephen, just a great team. I've just joined them uh, a couple months ago. Uh, from elsewhere in the organization have just joined the You Can Fly uh, group back in November. So I'm also involved with the Rusty Pilots Initiative and also get to support the You Can Fly ambassadors as well. So um, I may be by title uh, their boss, but by no means uh, are they serving me. It's it's vice versa. We've got a great team here and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of it. And Dan, too, and just and just to, to make sure we point out, too, you are a pilot yourself as well, instrument yep. rated SAC, right? Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, I started flying back in 2000 and um, shortly thereafter got my instrument rating um, and have gone through the trials and tribulations of a lot of other pilots out there where I, I get in, I get current, I get proficient, I'm flying for a good bit of time and then, uh, you know, life <laughs> kind of gets in the way. I'm a proud husband and father of four and uh, two dogs as well and uh, we're all busy with work and life. A lot of times uh, we don't fly as much as we'd like to, but um, certainly have the privilege and opportunity to do so as often as I can. Cool. Well, perfect. Thanks. And again, thanks for being here with us, Dan, and filling in My pleasure. at the last minute. Yeah, um, and a couple quick reminders. And by the way, you might pick up, actually, we could make that a little challenge. We Unfortunately, we don't have any prizes to give out today like, like you normally would. Um, but just for fun, maybe somebody can try to pick up on Dan's uh, accent if he has one at all and tell where he's from. So I won't reveal where he's from, but maybe you can figure that out. Um, all right. So reminders. Yes, this is the most important <laughs> reminder right here. Wings credit for this webinar, okay? If you are viewing this webinar with us live right now, not the recording later, but if you're viewing Wings credit, you are good to go as long as when you registered, you gave us the email that you also use for your FAA account. You don't have to do anything. 
as long as you gave us that email, you're good to go. If for some reason you didn't give us the email that goes with your FAA account, well, in that case, just let Stephen know and we will get you on the get that on the list. You can either email us here in the or just message us here in the chat or email us at ftinitiative at aopa.org, FT initiative, literally the letters FT, Foxtrot Tango, initiative at aopa.org. And the other common question we get is, will this be recorded? Why, in fact, it is. It will be on YouTube on the AOPA Live channel in just probably a day or two. So maybe end of tomorrow, um, certainly by the end of the, the weekend or whatever, but it'll be up and recorded. You will be able to see that. You can also find it on aopa.org, uh, the webinars page listed right there. Okay, and we will, and Dan, help me out. Let's make sure we remind everybody too as we go through as folks come and go, uh, potentially. Um, let's uh, make sure we remind them that wings credit thing. That's, that's the, the most common question. Okay. Absolutely. Hey, look at this. Today in aviation history, uh, June 30, 1968, the first flight of the Lockheed C-5 Galaxy. Pretty cool airplane. Um, I know that, Dan, you've worked a lot of the, the shows and everything we've done, the fly-ins, and I know we've had some of those there. So have you ever gotten we, to do anything special with them? Well, special in the sense that I have been able to walk aboard and explore one and look around. Um, I think it was the Colorado Springs fly-in. Oh, my gosh, that was years ago. But what a cool experience. It just happened to be on the ramp, and we had uh, a little bit of downtime, so we walked over and said hi, and the crew welcomed us aboard uh, and gave us a little tour. And it was just unbelievable, the massive amount of structure in that aircraft and just how big the cargo area was. It was amazing that of the stuff that you could put in. My house could fit in there, it felt like. It was awesome. It was <laughs> hey, really that'd cool. be cool to live in one. That'd be like, a, right. what a cool RV it would be, right? It would be hard. Well, <laughs> maybe the fuel price to keep that order, <laughs> Maybe that. Otherwise, maybe that. yeah, it, it was just a remarkable aircraft. And, and it, the scale is just hard to comprehend unless you're sitting there looking at it from the ground. I would imagine the flare would be kind of weird to be sitting up that high. But anyway, let's get to our poll today. Um, so our topic, of course, today is bundle your procedures with flow. Uh, so here's our poll, Stephen, if you'd go ahead and run that. And the question is, how often do you use your checklist while flying? Do you use it, A, just to get started? B, just periodically as you need it? Uh, C, for every phase of flight? Or D, checklist uh, are just for noobs or check flights only. In other words, like when you do a flight review or a check ride, that's the only time you need a checklist is just for if you're a new pilot or just that. I'm excited to see the answers to this one. I've got a hunch of what it's going to be, but um, I guess yeah. I'm going to use my personal flying to, to relate to this, but um, I've got a hunch. We'll see. I'm excited to see what the answers are. And you can see that, in fact, we'll reveal it here shortly. We got 57% so far. So um, we'll just give it a moment. We'll try to get it up to at least 75 to 80%. We'll give you folks a, a chance to answer. I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. I like it a lot. Um, and so, Dan, what do you think? What would you answer here, do you think? Uh, without a doubt, it's every phase of flight. It, it's so easy to get comfortable when you're flying the aircraft that you've flown in a lot, a flight that you've done a lot. It's so easy to try to do things automatically. But that's the exact time and place when you're going to forget something. Hopefully, it's not something important, but um, you know, but you know, maybe you didn't drop flaps at the right time or things like that. But um, you know, it, it's every phase of flight is critical for that checklist. It's like why risk it, right? Exactly. Hey, uh, Stephen, I think we've got 87%. Let's go ahead and reveal the results to our poll. Here it comes, and I think everybody should be able to see it here. Uh, and so as we can see there too, it's we've got, well, I like it, Jan, just like you said, you kind of went with the majority, 53% yeah. of folks are saying for every phase of flight, good answer. That's the one I like to hear. Um, 33 say periodically is needed, 13 just to get started. Uh, yeah. And then this is unusual. I don't think, Stephen, I don't think this has ever happened. We actually have sort of the, the jokey type choice, the, the checklist for noobs and check flights only. Nobody actually answered it this time. Normally somebody, at least one person will do it. Yeah. Um, what a, what a great item first. to have zero percent on though, right? <laughs> yes, I would agree. <laughs> so, all right, let's go ahead and we'll get back to the presentation. And so that said, that's the answer I, I love to hear. So hopefully what we're going to do today is reveal to you some ways, uh, maybe, in, you know, I imagine, I, I know we've got some experienced pilots on here today too. Um, it's probably something that you may already know, but for those that maybe um, maybe haven't heard of this, we'll give you some tips on how you can actually use that checklist, hopefully even more efficiently than normal. So what are we covering today? We're going to talk about why would we even want to standardize cockpit procedures? And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what is a flow itself? 
How can a flow increase safety when you bundle it with a checklist? Uh, some examples, a few exceptions to these, these rules, we'll call them, or guidelines. Uh, tips for creating your own flows in whatever airplane you're flying. And then finally, at the very end, some safety tips as well. And in fact, I actually added one on. I forgot to put it on the bullet point here, um, which was uh, some mnemonics you might be able to use too. So um, I'm hoping you guys will find this useful and make sure you keep asking the questions. Just let us know. All right. So number one thing, why, and by the way, before I even begin, two things. For wings credit, if you've already, you do get wings credit for this. If you're here live, just make sure you've given us the email to your um, FAA wings account. You don't need to do anything else. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to mention is you'll see a handout that's available today. Um, and basically, it's just a reference list because when I was doing this, the uh, actually Pablo was the one that came up with the idea. He's like, we should talk about this. and um, and he said, like, you know, it's something that I've always, I've kind of mentioned in the past. And so then when I was obviously, I just didn't want to just talk about my own experience here. So I did a little bit of research and I found some really good articles. And that's what the handout is, is the articles that I found that are applicable to everything we're talking about. So some of the stuff, even I was picking up some new stuff uh, as I went through that. So why standardized procedures? In the handout, there is the study. You can read it if you like. I read the executive summary. It's really long. It's a, a research study, but there's lots of stuff in it. But there's a 2010 NASA study that they went and they literally sat in the jump seats of airlines for 60 operational line flights and they monitored the the crew to see how many deviations there were to checklist usage or procedures and so in 60 flights they observed 899 deviations now that could be something where a checklist item was missed or uh you know a, a like a procedure was maybe done just slightly incorrectly or something like that but 899 so you figure this is two pilot crews flying every day professionally we know that they're very well trained and they had 899 deviations that were observed so what's the takeaway from that? That could be kind of scary, you would think. Um, but my takeaway from reading it was number one, yeah, mistakes are gonna happen, right? They're gonna happen, but we, they can be minimized. And in fact, in the study, they talked about the fact that even though there were 899 deviations because of the design of those airline procedures, all the overlapping safety and everything else, that there, there, were never, there weren't any accidents. There was nothing that unsafe that happened but they purposely designed it to then re be redundant and checking over all this stuff. So even with all those deviations, and by the way, there was a spread. There was like a couple of flights they went on, there were zero deviations. So that was a well done crew. Um, and then other ones that had potentially had more. So well, check Chris, out that study if you're interested, go ahead. Just thinking through that, it's like even with those skilled pilots that are well experienced um, and they're flying the same routes perhaps every day, it's still, every flight is different, right? Like everything that, every time you're doing it, even though it's something that you've flown, you've flown with the same people, it's like every, there's, the traffic is different, uh, the weather is different, the controllers are different, the conversations are different, the amount of traffic is different. Like every time you're flying, things are gonna be different. And then, you know, one more vote for using a checklist is you've got that as your common standard. Your consistency is built in through that. Exactly. And in fact, that's the, the point of the, the training part of it, which we'll talk about. But the, the key part here, too, that they said in the study, which is something that um, I had done some some uh, uh, graduate work with Embry Riddle type stuff. And in the human factors course that I took, it talked about the fact that the problem is that we're humans. And um, so the, you know, with humans, we're going to make mistakes. And I think it's about a one percent error or so. Um, Anyway, so that's going to happen. And so the question is, what can we do to design in the safety procedures? In fact, one of the questions that I had for you know just everybody out there, and maybe even you too, Dan, I want you just to, this could be a, a rhetorical question, but think back to your recent flights. Do you, did you miss anything? Did you find yourself missing items that you would look back and go, oh, shoot, I forgot to do that? Has that ever happened? How about you, Dan? Yeah, for sure. And one of them, and I saw on the messages that came up, um, that gumps was a common phrase that came up the gumps check mm -hmm. and um if i wasn't I, I noticed i was getting into the approach phase and i was i was getting down and getting close and realized that i hadn't done it because i hadn't looked at my checklist and the gumps is listed on my you know pre-descent checklist so or pre-landing checklist so it's like it's on there and i didn't use the checklist and sure enough good thing i was able to catch it close enough and it was single engine fixed gear so you know the gear wasn't the wasn't the piece that that would have fell out but even so it was uh something that i missed just because i didn't go through my checklist and it's a piece that i like to do every single time 
Exactly. And in fact, we're going to talk about the, the use of mnemonics too and things just like fact, Gumps is one of the ones I was going to use as an example. So it's a great example. And I, I'll tell you too, for me, it's like, uh, you know, um, I do regular do flight instruction. I forget stuff, too, especially it's, it's interesting when I'm flying with a student, I tend to catch all the stuff that they do because I have, it's like we, sure. we tease as flight instructors. We kind of have not a whole lot else to do except to, to watch what's going on. We see all of it, but then when we have to go fly ourselves, it's a whole different thing. We're, oh yeah, I forgot that this is busy. You know, it's easy when we're sitting over there. It's easier, I should say. Is um, that the uh, do as I say, not as I do? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so um, so that, for me, it's, that's why I, that's why I'm gonna give you my recommendations and I'll, I'll tell you, it's like I follow these procedures and, and uh, the stuff I'm going to share with you, it does help. So let's get into like some of this other parts of this, but I think this will help you. And in fact, the Gumps idea is a really good one. So what is a flow? When I use this word flow, some of you might be really familiar with this, um, but what is a flow? So the traditional flight training, and this is actually stuff that I pulled out of some of the articles as I was reading um, that I'd kind of known this and used my own methods and my own training in the past that I've had. But they talked about traditionally in flight training, and I can this this fits with me during my private and even my instrument, that I was taught to redo. You take the checklist, you read down the list, and you do it, and you do the next item, and you do it, especially when you're brand new or new to an airplane. A flow, however, the redo means I read the item and then I do it. A flow is different where you have a procedure, whether memorized or just systematic, and that's kind of what I do is more of a systematic thing, um, that I do it and then I pull out the checklist and I verify that I did it. So for an example I wanted to give, I think we've all done pre-flights. Uh, and so with that, with the pre-flight part of it, um, think about how you do a pre-flight. It's like, I've, I have seen people that'll walk around doing their pre-flight with checklist in hand. That's the way I learned how to do it as well. But since then, I've now gotten to the point where I go do the pre-flight and then I might have the checklist with me if it's in my back pocket or I just go grab it out of the airplane. I always do it before I get in the airplane, but I go and do my pre-flight and then I pull the checklist out and go down the items and check afterwards to see if I missed anything. And invariably, I have things that I miss every time, which is normally the air vents. I always forget to look at those. Uh, occasionally, I might forget to, as I'm walking around, it's like I, every once in a while, I might forget the static port. And so I use the checklist, oh yeah, I forgot that. And I go look or the whatever. So there's a couple items typically on the front of the airplane that you know I'll, I make it distracted or something and I forget to do it. So do verify means I do it and then I back it up with a checklist. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why, but this method, this idea of using a flow and then backing it up with a checklist is what's used by professional pilots. I learned it um, as I became a flight instructor, the school where I was was very oriented towards training people to be airline pilots. Uh, and then I flew freight and the company I flew for acted, they were very much like an airline. So we had very um, set procedures and that's where it was drilled into me to do it this way. And I will tell you that you can use this method on most procedures. And I'm gonna guess that a lot of the folks out there that have done some flying, um, any kind of professional flying for sure, have had this experience and been trained this way, military pilots too. All right, so the question is this idea of flow, and I put down the question here, does a flow equal increased safety? So let's talk about the way that normally most of us are trained when we're first learning to fly. The redo method. Definitely the redo is good if you're a new pilot, you're learning procedures, or if you're transitioning to a new airplane, because it literally has the, the recipe for how do I get the airplane started? Um, and so uh, with that said, um, that's a good method for that beginning part. However, if you think about it, there's a lot of looking back and forth. Think about like, I actually do redo when I do like the, uh, the engine start or run up. I will kind of do that and I have sort of half flow, half redo, because some of it obviously it's like, I know when I do a mag check, I know what I'm looking for and then I go back and check it. But for the redo, you're thinking like, okay, master switch on, master switch on. Then this, that, you know, there's a lot of looking back and forth from the checklist to the item. Some people might hold it in front of them as they go. Um, but you can tell me if you've had this happen to you. I know for me, I've been doing redo and then I realize I skipped an item. And it's like, and the thing is, if you skip that item, you don't realize you missed it because you just go to the next item. And I've, and I've observed this with students. So I, that's my advantage being a flight instructor. I've seen students do this where they'll be reading and doing and they'll miss an item. And they'll just keep going, not knowing that they even missed it in the first place. Mm -hmm. I see you're nodding your head, Dan. So something like that happened to you? Yeah, I, I'm actually, I'm going back to a different phase of life. I was doing safety inspections and I would could talk through things where I would be like, yep, check that, check that, check that. But if I didn't actually put my hand on that nut and bolt, 
then I didn't have a high level of confidence that I was doing it. So similar in that story, but it's like, you know, you, you really need to, to literally do it to get your hands on it, to touch it, to make sure that you have it. Just personal experience from a different chapter of life uh, yes. for me and, and a mental checklist in that case. So um, to give you an example of, so if I did the redo in this case, like a route climb checklist, right? And I do it every phase of flight. And I think I saw somebody kind of as it flowed through, I'm kind of, I try to watch the questions. It's hard also while I'm, I'm looking at this stuff, but um, I saw somebody mention like what the triggers are, like when you do it. And so for me, every time I reach a new phase of flight, I do a trigger. Admittedly, I am human. The one that often gets missed is the climb flow because I'll be busy mm -hmm. looking for traffic and I'll forget to do that. I'll, I'll kind of go up to like, cause usually I'm just going to the practice area and then we'll level off. I'm like, shoot, forgot my climb flow. Right. But, um, uh, and so then usually I'll, I'll back it up and do it, especially if, if I'm flying by myself. So admittedly, I do that, and that's why I try to use that trigger. So I think every time I turn or whatever, I try to think to myself, is there a flow that I should be doing or a checklist that I should be doing? So every phase of flight. So let's check this out. Let's talk about how you would do a flow, though. So with the flow idea, instead, and I'm using a Cessna, and by the way, I forgot to mention, we wanted to thank Sporties. Uh, we had some friends at Sporties that let us use their pictures. So just give them a shout out. Thanks for doing that. You can get a free poster from Sporties of this cockpit if you want it. So just go in there and look up free poster, Sporties. You can get the 172. I think they've got a couple others. Does All everybody right. have that poster? I know I've had one. I've got one right here in my office. So yes, yeah. hopefully everybody's got it. I guess we haven't um, done your training in a 172, maybe yeah. not so much, but I feel like yeah, everybody has. Yeah, a couple has. other ones too. So, right. um, Yes, I totally agree. So the do verify method works like this. This is the flow, and I will get into more detail later about how I do it in the 172. It's what I've got the majority of the, the GA time that I've done. And so I start down here at the fuel selector. So I go, um, I, it's more efficient. So if you watch what I do is I literally, I have the same flow for everything in a 172 for a training type airplane, like a 172 or an Archer, generally our GA aircraft are, that aren't as complicated, a flow like this works pretty well. So I do it every time there's an, I change the phase of flight, I do my flow and then I go back and check my checklist. So mm -hmm. in this case, what I would do is that this is a, um, you know, whatever it would be, I go fuel selectors on both. If it's a, depending on it's fuel injector or not, fuel shutoff valve is in. I come up, I check the trim, make sure it's trimmed where it should be or trimming for takeoff, whatever. I come over to the flaps right here, flaps, mixture, throttle, um, depending, it might have carb heat, so I might check that. Might might check the breakers, you know, check those. Usually I do that more on pre-flight and I just keep an eye on them. Mm -hmm. um, over here to the mags and the, and the primer, up to, in this case, this airplane was redesigned, so it's got stuff in a little different place, the master switch and avionics and the different switches. So I think to myself, switches, do I need to change any of my lights? Landing light off, strobes on or off, whatever it might be. Um, then up, and then I come across here, this airplane happens to have a glass panel, so there's not as much to check on it. If I had um, like a heading indicator and I might check it against the compass, that's what my cue would be. Come down the engine instruments here, just making sure they're all in the green. And then I pop back up and go down the avionics and radios, just check them all and just verify. So I do that every one. You can imagine me doing this. I'm gonna, you're gonna cover even student pilots, it doesn't take them long. They're gonna hit at least 90% of the stuff that needs to be done. Once you get familiar, you're gonna hit the vast majority of it just by doing that. Then I grab my checklist and I read it. So if I just said all the stuff I just checked, if I click, here's the checklist for an en route climb. Did I hit it? Airspeed 70 to 80 knots, right? Throttle full open. So I think throttle, I checked it. It should be full open and mixture rich. So maybe here what I would catch on the checklist would be, oh, I had mixture full rich, but I'm above 3,000 feet. I should have leaned it. And so then I can use the checklist to remind me, oh, yeah, I'm climbing above 3,000. Let's lean it as I'm climbing. You know, it's sort of a, a, a cruise climb type of in leaning it as I do it. So less head down time and it gives redundancy. And this is the part that I love so much. This is the part that I talk to my students about and just emphasize so much. By doing this method, you can act like you're an airline crew because now I'm flowing and then I pull the checklist out and it's a double check, just as if I had another pilot with me running and verifying that everything that I just did. Um, and the other part that I do is I talk out loud while I fly, even by myself. I'm in the cockpit and I'm like, fuel selector is on both, trim is set mixture you know, is leaned or whatever. So I literally say these things out loud and then I pull the checklist out and run it and talk about it. And then I'll kind of like look and verify, touch stuff just to make sure, did I check that? Did I check that? Did I check that? Yes, I'm good. And it's a very efficient way and it gives redundancy to our flying. Hey Chris, we've got a couple of interesting questions. Um, they're both focused on checklists, but I, sorry to pause the flow talk on this one, but I thought they're really good questions. Uh, one from Dan is, why is there a tendency to always go so fast through the checklist? 
Um, so, you know, happy to hear your thoughts on that for me or for, for um, on you. But for me, I think I, I suffer from that all the time. I want to get it done. I want to get it focused on the next phase. I always want to be ready. But, um, you know, that's situational awareness, I think. Um, for that is just to be purposeful about the checklist. But of course, we need to keep our eyes when we're flying VFR, our eyes outside the cockpit. And there's always so much going on that, you know, you, you want to keep focused on others. So we're rushed to get through it. That'd be my answer to that is just human nature. Chris, what do you think on that one? I, I completely agree, human nature. And the other thing that I would add into that, just from observing people doing flight reviews and IPCs and, and that sort of stuff, I feel like there's, I could almost do like a graph, like sort of a, a regression, right? Um, because as the person's experience is higher, whether they're current or not, but as their experience is higher, they feel like they're farther away from training, the faster they tend to try to go. And I think it's almost, it's that idea of that task, um, maybe that mission mindset that we have as pilots, and they feel like I'm more experienced, I should be able to do this more quickly. And they kind of try to rush through, or I, I know I've, I've worked with people and they've been flying with other pilots that have a ton of experience, especially like they have a pilot that might have their own airplane. And so they tend to go quick. So they think they need to go quick. Right. And my number one thing that I say is slow down, because when I see people doing that, invariably, they, they're skipping things. They miss things. And, I, and in fact, I even have to discipline myself. It's, to, it's like I find it's, whether it's like maybe it's busy, there's traffic and things, we're trying to hurry up. It doesn't do you any good to hurry up and miss stuff. So slow down, and if you see yourself, you feel yourself doing that, say, I gotta stop, I gotta breathe, I gotta do this right, because yeah. that's the discipline. It's, it's, it's the biggest thing that we have in aviation is we have to be disciplined to stay safe. Um, and rushing like that, um, just trying to be aware, be aware of what you're doing, and if you are rushing, just think to yourself, I gotta slow down, I gotta, yeah. like, I gotta yeah. take a break. Yep. Totally that's, agree. That's great. Um, another one from Eric, and, and hopefully we can get through that quick, but it was, how do you build a new checklist after new avionics are installed. So this is a whole different change of environment for yeah. that one. My thought process is kind of two part. One, study the avionics. Lo yep. Learn it when you can, do it on the ground if you can, You know, learn it that way so you know what's gonna be different and you can get that kind of built into your flows and built into your idea, like practice it on the ground. Um, and do it that way, but also, you know, learn what you can from manufacturer. They're the ones that have built it. They know what's best. So learn everything you can from that about your system. Um, but then also, and and I'd throw this out there to you, Chris, but um, if I knew you were a CFI that was flying with that suite of avionics or have some experience with that, I would love to go flying with you yep. to use that resource. And you can show me, um, you can tell me and show me in flight. And that would kind of help build that confidence for me. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, in fact, I'm going to talk about that a little later. I'm going to talk about how you can create a checklist for yourself for a new airplane. You could use the same method um, for when designing something if you've got new avionics uh, and that sort of thing. And the biggest part is just getting familiar with it because it's right. going to be something that evolves too. As you get more familiar, you're going to get more efficient. You're going to figure things out. So um, the quick answer to that, and I'll go into more detail later, would be basically like you said, definitely get training on it and do it in small chunks. The biggest thing I see, and I'm I'm going through this right now because I'm learning, um, doing IPCs currently, a lot more of them than I have in the past, is really learning the ins and outs of the GTN 750 and the GTN uh, 650s, right? And so with that, there's stuff in there that I don't, it's like it does, it's like four flight. It does way more stuff than, I know it does way more than I know, and I slowly yeah. learn things. Do it in small chunks. And in fact, I'd even start with, think of the tasks that you need to use on the, on the instrument or the GPS or whatever it might be. Think of what do I need it to do and just learn that and then build that into your checklist potentially or uh, into your knowledge base and then slowly build on it. Do not try to learn all of it at once. It is overwhelming and you're not gonna remember it. And that's coming from me just as, a, as the, the teacher in me coming out. You're not gonna remember all that. So, all right, let's jump to this next one. Here's an example of what I do for the after landing. So how can we do an after landing? Uh, and this will be the flow that I would use for after landing. This is literally the flow written out. And then I will show you the official POH checklist for the after landings. This is after I've landed, I've gotten off the runway, I've pulled clear of the runway and I've paused a second, you know, probably monitoring ground if I've been told to do so, but I've paused just to clean the airplane up before I start taxiing. So for me, again, there's that same flow. Fuel selectors on both, trim is set. Notice it's set back for takeoff. So it's ready to go if I was taxiing back or from my next takeoff, I set it for takeoff right then. Flaps are up tend not to mess with flaps while you're on the runway. Uh, mixture set, in this case, I would lean it for taxi. Um, throttle set, 
lights as required, I'd probably turn the landing light or if I had the taxi light, uh, depending on what I had on or what the conditions were, but I'd probably turn a couple of lights off. Um, mags, uh, just checking them on both, primers in and locked in this case, and this, this is a carbureted airplane. Uh, engine instruments still in the green, radios and nav set, so I'd probably switch it over to ground if I was told to do so, and then just verifying the autopilot was off. Now check out the official checklist in the POH. Wing flaps up. So this flow is way more comprehensive. I'm gonna catch a lot of things that aren't even on the checklist. So it's not even doing things like leaning and other stuff. So you can add on, and that's what I know somebody was asking about, you can add on, you can create your own checklist for airplanes. As long as you include the minimum required by the manufacturer, you can add other stuff on if it helps. But just be careful you don't add too much stuff onto it to where it becomes kind of unusable. Now, what if I just made my own checklist based off of the flow? Um, that is totally fine using the flow. And what some people might say was, well, what if I just make the flow my checklist? No, don't do that. <laughs> the point of the checklist is redundancy because I know there's, I was reading in one of the articles and they said, some people say the cockpit is my checklist. And I'm trying to think back. I think I've heard people say that in the past too. No, that the, the flow is great. So you, If you know the cockpit that well, definitely do it. But that's the whole point I'm trying to get at is then use the checklist as your redundant back, you know, sort of verifying, did I check all those things? So do your flow, be efficient, and then pull the checklist out and verify it. So don't use just one, do the double redundancy at least. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, here's an example of a flow in an airplane that's maybe a little bit more complicated. This is a, a Piper a PA-44, it's a Seminole. Um, I used to instruct in these when I was instructing full time. Unfortunately, I haven't gotten to fly multi in a long time. I don't need to see those around much anymore, really, um, when it comes to like the typical GA stuff. But with the flow. So here what I might do for the flow, and notice it's got, it's got, there's a lot more stuff happening in this cockpit when you look at it. There's because there's got two engines, um, it's got two sets of mags, you've got cow flaps to deal with, you've got landing gear. So it's a little more complex. So again, what you're gonna do is look at the procedures and see is there something that would be pretty comprehensive that I could use for most things. And you might even in some airplanes, like I used to fly uh, the Beach 99, and there's an article that I included on the list of uh, experienced King Air pilot talking about the procedures that they use. So sometimes when you get into more complex airplanes, your flow, you might have different ones depending on what you're doing. So you just gotta be aware of that. Um, so the more complex the airplane, the more complex the operation becomes. You're just looking for ways to be efficient and simplify it. So in this case, for the flow, down here in the center panel in the Seminole, there are the fuel selectors, so I'd probably check those before takeoff. Um, the flap, there's a big, like one of those like parking brake handles like in a Piper. So I'd check that, make sure it's set. I'd set the trim um, for takeoff. Then I check the cow flaps. The cow flaps are right down in here. Make sure that those are open. Go up to the mixture throttle and props. So mixture likely, unless I'm at density altitude, would likely be full forward. Props full forward for takeoff and throttles ready to go. Um, and then move along. Just check my mags uh, and the fuel pumps. Uh, I'm trying to remember the fuel pumps are supposed to be on in a seminal for takeoff. I think they are. Um, and then checking the mags. Work my way up come across, check the warning lights, then down, looking at the engine instruments, and then I might sort of pop over here, just sort of, okay, I did this, and then just jump here, avionics and down, check all the different switches for lights in the various systems. Then I would run the checklist, and here's the official checklist for before takeoff for a Seminole. Notice it's cow flops open, so I'm thinking, did I do the cow flops? Yes, I did. Transponder, notice it's way out of order, but I would have done that as part of my avionics. So I'd say, did I check the transponder? Yep, I did it. Flaps, I did that early on, but I can look down and just verify. I, I did check those and they're where I want them. Warning lights, notice how out of order it is here too. Go up and check the warning lights. The door, that's one thing I didn't remember, right? That's what I use the checklist for. Oh, gotta make sure I latch that top latch. Actually, it's over here on the summit, as I recall. Um, and then the parking brake release. So it's like there's less stuff on it. You're gonna be probably including more things, but it can cover a bunch of the items. Hey, Chris, I've got a, a real world question that came up and I think it leads well into the question earlier about you know our, our tendency to race through checklists to get it done quickly. Um, yes. And this could be a reason why this came from Mike and it, it was, you know, what strategies can you suggest for dealing with interruptions? Like ATC calling and talking and how do you pick up where you left off on your checklist? Um, and, and I thought that was a great question and really pertinent to what we were talking about earlier. You guys are like forward thinking because that's coming up. I think it's one of the last slides to talk about safety tips. And that's exactly it. The, the quick answer to that, just for that one particular item is when yeah. you get interrupted, the, prof the what professionals do is you start over again. So it's Good like point. if you do your flow, which normally, 
like that flow I just talked about normally takes me less than 30 seconds, if that. Like I do a, um, when I'm doing touch and goes in the 172 with students, it's like I'm, I might demonstrate a landing and so I, I have them do the same thing. I do that flow, it doesn't take very long and then I back it up with a checklist. So I would do my flow and then we used to, at my uh, the flight school where I, I work full time, um, we used to do a thing where we would say, okay, checklist is on standby. Right, and then we would go back, and so it's like if we were trying to run our flow or our checklist, and we got interrupted, say I'm putting it on standby, or in that case, if I got interrupted, I'm just going to start over again because I don't know what I missed, and it's very easy to miss things. That's one of the things that NASA study looked at too, is that they start over again, um, and so that's the that's the key part. So yes, it is hard. Interruptions are hard, and when you're busy, and I know when you're flying instruments too, it gets really busy, and so you just have to build all these things in. The biggest thing is redundancy. Like for example. If I'm flying an airplane with gear, I check the gear three or four times mm -hmm. on every landing. I check it on down when I put them down, down three green, you know, three green, one in the mirror in the Seminole, for instance. Turn base, three green, one in the mirror. Turn final, three green, one in the mirror. And I might check it again because I just verify that gear is down. I don't want to land gear up. So it's that redundancy, building in some of that repetition is a good thing and make it a habit. Um, and and you know, if you're annoying people, that's good. You should be annoying people. We want that repetition for the safety part of it. Hey, Chris, just quick note. We had a note from Kay, one of the AOPA You Can Fly Ambassadors, hey, the Kay. Western US region, which I thought was really good. And it was about the idea of, you know, keeping track of where you are on the checklist when there's interruptions. She keeps one finger on the checklist on the lap board and then uses that other hand to do the task itself. So not just during interruptions, but all the time is that she keeps her place that way so she knows where to go. Um, that's a good, I used to do that too. It was something similar in that fact, I would just throw my finger down. But, uh, and I agree, that's a good technique. Just make sure that like I'm, what I'm recommending here is learn the flow and then back it up. So as you're doing, moving that finger down. But the one thing that I've had trouble in the past where it's it's bitten me is if I tried to do the redo in the finger and sometimes your finger will move and you don't realize it. And that's where you can skip sure. things. So just be, be sure. wary. Um, Here's an example too of the pre-flight flow as an as uh, pre-flight inspection as a flow, and I kind of mentioned this. I just wanted to show you. This is a generic. It's not the actual 172 checklist. This is an FAA checklist that I developed, um, pulling it out of the airplane flying handbook for, um, or actually our uh, after the AOPA AOPA flight training advantage. We got lots of good stuff in there, by the way. If you haven't checked it out, aopa.org/afta. A F T A. Um, anyway, this checklist stuff is in there, and when doing the flow, that walk around. What I do, like I said, is I do the walk around and then I pull the checklist out and I verify afterwards. And I invariably, I almost, I think every pre-flight, I catch at least one thing and I'm like, oh, yep, forgot to look at that. Like I said, normally it's the air vents and, and like sometimes the static port is the common things, but there's other stuff that I forget. I'm like, oh, yep, forgot that. So that's the point of doing it. Okay. Now, what are the, there are some exceptions to the rule here, maybe when you wouldn't want to do a flow where a redo type situation might be better. And this is, came from an article that I found. I forget which one it was off the top of my head. I think it was an AOPA one that was put out. Um, and this I thought was interesting. So for abnormal procedures, and I, I agree with these, by the way, for abnormal procedures, it's things that don't happen often that aren't necessarily like time critical. Things like landing gear not extending or low voltage indication. It's not something that's like, if I don't do something right now, something really bad is going to happen. I've got a second to just follow the procedure. And it's things that you may not normally memorize. So for example here, like the landing gear not extending if you're in a retractable gear airplane. The recommendation here is pull the checklist out and start following the procedure. If you have another pilot or a passenger with you, have them read the checklist as you do the things. Um, and so that way you can still have that redundancy. But that's a good recommendation. For me, one of the ones is low voltage, because in fact, I, I'm a huge proponent when we talk about emergency procedures here, and I know we did an entire webinar on that, um, I think it was last year sometime, but of I really drill people and I drill myself on emergency procedures because for the memory items, you need to know those. But one mm -hmm. of my tricks that I'll do is in the emergency procedure checklist in most general aviation, um, normally we don't have them listed out as abnormal, but is the low voltage one. And so in that one, it's like, I'll be giving somebody a, a check flight or whatever, and I'll say, okay, you see a low voltage indication, the light comes on, what are you doing? They're trying to memorize. I'm like, no, first step is take out the checklist. That's all you have to do. Cause they think they think they have to have it memorized. And this one I'm actually checking, use your checklist. Cause there's nothing critical there that you, you have to do right now. Pull the checklist out and just follow it. There's no reason to memorize it. 
um, that you know not that you should you can't memorize it but it's just not it's not critical so use a checklist as, a, as an option there so do that's where it's a good idea to do a redo so things that aren't normal your normal stuff like climb flow leveling off landings those should all be things that i would recommend that you do with a flow personally i do the um the engine start and the engine run up i do those as redos typically like i said sometimes there's parts of it that i have memorized that i just do and then i'll verify after i do it um, but for the most part i redo those because i don't want to mess up putting a switch on in the wrong order or something hey chris quick question about when doing touch and goes um mm -hmm. it's a time sensitive and and task saturated moment in time yeah. or moments in time what do you what do you recommend about flow and checklist at that point it seems like it'd be tough to be super thorough with both of those during during touch and goes so mm -hmm. i can tell you actually i still do the flow um the way i do it is if we're in the pattern and we're doing uh like say we're just staying in the pattern and we're doing a series of landings say we're doing three five whatever number of landings just practicing on the first time, so let's say that I'm, um, let's give you the situation too, that I'm literally taxiing out, I'm taking off and saying, hey, I'm remaining in the pattern. On the first go on downwind, so as once I turn crosswind, and I'm typically by the time I'm turning crosswind, I'm just about pattern altitude. So once I level off, and usually I turn downwind, because crosswind's not really all that long of a leg, I turn downwind, I immediately run my before landing flow and my checklist. I do the checklist the first time. And the reason for that is because um, I want that habit. I do the same thing when I'm training people. I want that habit built. The first time, do the checklist. So the flow and then checklist. After that, because it's really only the before landing checklist and flow that you're doing. After that, then it's just a flow. If it's a simple airplane. So if it's something like a 172 where there's really, there's not a whole lot to do. You're messing with flaps in the throttle. There's not, you're like doing much else. So it's just verifying. And so literally every go around, cause I want that habit built, right? Every down when we roll out, we come on down when it's like before landing flow, fuel selectors on both, fuel shut off valve is in, mixture set, throttle set you know, mags are on both. Um, and then I'll just, you know, verify, just come over and radios. I'm not really, it's not really a thing. So radios have already been checked, seat belts and shoulder harnesses checked and doors locked or whatever it is. So, mm -hmm. so I just do that flow. So every time, so I'd recommend that for the habit when you're on the actual touch and go itself. So you've done your landing and now you're going up. It depends on the airplane. So it's like, you might have a flow that's more complicated stuff like a 172 or an archer. It's not a whole lot to do there. It's just flaps up, throttle and go. Um, and, and just verify and then do your climb out. So that's kind of what I do. So in, in the pattern, I'll just stick with just the before landing every time, just verifying. Um, if you're flying one with a retractable gear, I might add in at least, maybe you'd create a touch and go, like you do the initial before landing checklist and have like a touch and go version where it's literally just checking gear and cow flaps is probably the common things. So like flaps, cow flaps and gear, um, and maybe props full forward, um, something like that if you're flying a more complex airplane. So I hope that answers the question. Um, for the emergency procedures, for time critical things, this is where you want to split it up. And so the recommendation to start with is like, for example, here on the engine fire in flight, the time critical ones are those bolded ones, right? These are ones like if I have an engine fire in flight, I do not want to be reading a checklist. I want to just know what I'm supposed to do. And this is the stuff you need to drill, make flashcards, uh, put it on your phone or whatever and drill them. Um, I used to do this when I was flying professionally. I was flying every day. Uh, flying like Piper Chieftains and Beach 99, on my way to the airport, I would run through my emergency checklist and my procedures because I knew I'm loaded down with a bunch of cargo and I'm taking off. If I lose an engine, I got to be able to know what I'm doing right then and I don't have time. So I drilled it every day while I was flying, um, doing that doing freight flying. So that's what I'd recommend. And also look at these, just because it's not bolded by the, um, uh, the manufacturer doesn't mean you can't bold it. For example, engine fire during start right i mean like untrained reaction is boom i'm gonna get out of the airplane and just run but we actually do have a procedure where it's like keep cranking you know and it's like depending see if i can get it started if not then it's mixture and you know fuel selector off mixture uh and uh throttle out actually i think it's throttle full forward just to get all the fuel out um of what's in the line but cut off the rest of the fuel supply so that sort of thing so you want to have that stuff memorized uh and ready to go so you can do it and then have the checklist obviously as a backup so yeah to think to yourself, think common sense. What stuff do I need to know? One of the ones I love is for the, uh, if you have an over voltage indication, there's a really easy memory item for that one. I've got the runaway alternator. It's just master switch off. 
that's my one memory item, and then I go get the checklist. I can read it to that because I just turn off all the electricity. Same thing if I thought there was like smoke or something, electrical fire potentially. It'd just be mash the switch off. If that seems to cut it, I'm good. Otherwise, I might extinguish. But then it's just like now get the checklist and read what it says. Mm -hmm. So use your, just use your good common sense. Good point. Okay. Now, for those folks that were asking these, I've got the last three slides are creating your own flows, using mnemonics, and then the safety tips what to do. This creating your own flows comes from an FAA document. Um, it's actually for airlines, for airlines how to create an SOP or a standing op standard operating procedure. Um, and so I'm gonna go through these. Some of these you'll say, well, that's not necessarily applicable to us. But if you think about it, a lot of them are. Number one, when you're creating a flow for your aircraft, uh, and depending on what it is, because you'll know the airplane or work with a flight instructor or somebody that's really experienced flying it and to have them help you. But make sure it's appropriate to the situation. You know, it's like maybe you don't want to be like if I'm on the um, the ground or whatever. I'm just trying to think of a situation where I might not check things. Um, you know, it's like once I'm in cruise, I may not be checking gear up every time. I'm not going to check that every five minutes. It's like the gear was up. It should still be up. I probably will notice if something happens. So make sure it's appropriate to the situation. Make sure it's practical. This is where I was saying if you put too much stuff in there, um, then then it may become unusable to you. So don't make it so complicated and, and convoluted that you won't be able to remember it. So try to keep it simple. Um, make sure that, here's this crew members understand the reasons. Make sure you understand the reason. This is where I, we, we've done some webinars on systems. Knowing your systems will help you understand what to do. Because you can think to yourself, well, this should be done in this order. Or you can even look at the checklist that way. Why did the manufacturer put it in that order? And a lot of times it's because of the way the system works. So try to understand the system and help you understand the reason for why you're doing it that way. Um, make sure that whatever you're doing is clearly delineated. Training, make sure, effect, this is airline, like make sure effective training is conducted that everybody adheres to it. What I would say to us as general aviation pilots is come up with a procedure and then make it standardized. Say, this is the way I'm gonna do it. Not that it can't ever be amended or edited, but this is the way I'm gonna do it and then train yourself to do it that way every time. Because I will tell you, my experience is that when stuff goes wrong, the training that you've done is what's gonna kick in. And if you haven't trained, then that's what's gonna kick in. Um, and I, the one experience I'll give you is I was flying a Beach 99. It was early morning, which is basically a stretched out King Air. I was up over the Arizona desert. I'd gotten in cruise, I was in cruise for a while and I was just chilling because I, I had a ways to go to get to this one VOR and then I was turning it on my way to Vegas um, where the run ended. And I remember as I was just chilling there, I was kind of just like it's droning, it's early morning and I've, you know, I've been up, you know, I was up really early, like always for flying that stuff. And both the engine fire lights popped on. And the initial reaction I had was, holy crap. And I went like this and I went like that and I looked at both engines and I thought to myself, what are the chances that both my engines just caught on fire at the same time? Because my thought was, do I need to pull the fire extinguishers, right? So what happened then was there was some panic there. Like that woke me up big time because I was kind of just chilling and kind of relaxing. And it was like that, the adrenaline started pumping. And what did I do? I pulled the checklist out because that's what I was trained to do. I pulled sure. the checklist out and went through it. And it turns out all it was was there was a little selector switch we used to test the lights and it had vibrated down into the test position. And so I fixed it and it was it. And I was like, whew. I was really awake for the rest of that flight. I did not settle down after that. But that, so just but I, my point though is that what you train is what you're going to do. And so train yourself the same way, come up with a standard procedure and just drill yourself on it. It will make you a better and safer pilot. Hey, Chris, finally, yeah. quick, oh, sorry. Um, did you reference an FAA doc when creating flows, uh, or is that more of an SOP doc? Just a question on was that an FAA doc? Was that the standard operating procedures and pilot monitoring duties for flight deck crew members? That's the document that this is based on. This is an okay. FAA document. It's for one, okay. I think it's, it's AC 120, which is basically used for 121 operations, but yeah. we can learn from it. So there's okay. some good stuff in there about how to do it. Um, then there was another FAA doc, as I recall, on this. Actually, it's coming up on the one after this. Okay. Um, here's about the using mnemonics, which I think is such a weird word when you look at the way it's spelled. I did not want to spell it that way. But um, so the memory aids, these are memory aids that you could help to create flows. And if somebody mentioned gumps earlier, that's a really classic one. I've definitely heard of that. I've even heard BC gumps, which has boost pumps, um, cow flaps, and then we used to use it in the Seminoles, so BC gumps, and then the, the gumps after that. Um, so you can actually use gumps for climb, cruise, and before landing. So it's gas. For those that don't know what it is, number one, there's an article on the uh, um, handout that has the link to this. But it's gas is the G. U is for undercarriage, which is the landing gear. Uh, so if you're in a 172 or something, I, I always make the joke of like it's down and welded. Um, <laughs> M is for mixture. 
P is for the propeller, like propeller levers, if you're flying one of those. And then, and of course, like again, if you're in a 172, it's still there. And then S is for safety items. That could be seat belts, uh, shoulder harness. It might be the lights. It's up to you to kind of what that means. So you could use this to help you make up a flow that you're going to use. Um, but then, like you see there, I emphasize it is not a checklist replacement. So don't use gumps as a checklist replacement. Use gumps uh, for, oh, somebody even says they use forest gump which is the cow flaps and that's, that's pretty good. So, um, so you know, use, use it as the way to build your flow as a memory item, but then back it up with a checklist. Okay. So I'm doing my, before, you know, my cruise flow gumps, you did it. Checklist verified that I did everything on that checklist right. and a good mnemonic will help you cover most of it. If not all of it, I like, this is one I, I like to use too, is the five C's for go arounds, which is cram, climb, clean, cool call. So cram is throttle in full power to start climbing. And of course, metered by the type of airplane you're flying. If you're flying like a Bonanza, it's the smooth introduction of power, not too much, not too quick, I mean. Uh, climb is start to get yourself either leveled off and starting the climb attitude. Clean would be getting flaps and gear up as appropriate and in the appropriate order. Cool, if you have cow flaps, cool it off. And then finally, notice the call is at the end. Trust me, ATC will know you're doing a go around. You think it's like it's the it's not a big surprise to them, you know, when you call and say we're going around, like they we can tell, you know, so they they know you're going around. Um, but make sure that's the last thing you do. Keep control of the airplane. So not a checklist. See that article for more details. It's they have a bunch of cool mnemonics in there. Some I hadn't even heard of before. At a non-towered field, I think that call becomes even more apparent um, for that situation because you let everybody else know around you what's going on because they may not be picking up exactly what you're exactly. doing. Exactly. So I'm not saying don't do it, but notice yep. it's fly the airplane. It's that aviate, navigate, Absolutely. communicate thing. Fly yep. the airplane first, keep it under control, then call. Okay. Um, so the last bit here before we get to our just our final part for questions is safety tips. Um, and so for this, 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 I think all came from an FAA document. It did. This is also from that AC-120. I pulled some stuff out of it. Um, this is that one that was made for that 121 operations, but I think it's very applicable. And they even mentioned single pilot stuff in here. So the one thing they said was for single pilot, the FAA recommends mounting the before takeoff and before landing checklist right on the instrument panel in front of you. So it's readily available to you to see. This is one that I wholeheartedly believe in. Develop touch verification procedures. Do my flow. I'm running my checklist. I will look and touch to make sure that I did that because yep. I, I, I do my flow and then it's like fuel selector is on both. I will literally touch down. Fuel selector is on both. I'm verifying it. So touch everything to make sure you actually did it. Here's one, Dan, that I'll throw to you from what you said earlier too. It's really easy as you get into this and you get the habit built up to just be like, blah, 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 blah. I did all of it, right? You, it's like, I have to catch myself and say, nope, Chris, stop. Take a moment and think, is that actually what I wanted? Is the fuel selector, where do I want it? Or if I'm thinking like, oh, flaps, make sure the flaps are where to think to yourself, what do I want this to be? Where do I want the mixture to be? Where do I want the throttle to be? And if you find yourself rushing, that's the even more important time to slow down. Yeah, uh, if, make sure if you think for about the checklist, it. it's check, you will could perhaps get in that habit of saying like, gas, check instead yeah. of where is the gas or the fuel selector valve it's on both i do that same thing for my fuel selector check it's like it's on both or you know depending on the phase of flight if you're um change it takes things like that but that's a great exactly point. don't just say check what do you want where do you want it to be exactly and same thing i know for me it's often i will delay the uh the prop on a 182 i'll delay the prop full forward if i'm coming in i like to do my before landing checklist as soon as i'm in the airport environment like i'm getting close i will generally run that because i want to get stuff out of the way so that i can focus on landing but oftentimes i'll say to myself oh yeah i'll put the prop on standby sometimes that is the wrong thing to do because then i forget to push it full forward before i'm final so it's about building the procedures that will help you remember um some checklist error prevention tips these are from the faa uh, and I thought these were pretty good. Remember to use the checklist. So it's really easy to do your flow or your mnemonic and then not use the checklist. That's the part that's going to provide that safety aspect is that backup, that redundancy of actually using the checklist. Check it. Here it is. Check it every time, every item, every time. So slow down and do every one of them because it's you think, oh, I've, I've flown this airplane a bazillion times. That's when you can make dumb mistakes. I've done it. Like I've, I've got thousands of hours in 172s and I've made mistakes, forgotten stuff because I was starting to get sloppy. And so it's that, it's that discipline. You have to do it every time. Slow, look at this, slow down and confirm significant items. Mm -hmm. So the FAA is right there with us. Um, deliberately read the checklist. For me, the pre-flight is the one that I'm most guilty of doing this on. 
is where it's like I sit there and go through it, and I literally have to stop myself because I've done my how many times have I pre-flighted an airplane? Like a lot. And so I pull the checklist out and it's like, you know, kind of like, okay, I literally have to say, slow down and did I do that? Did I do that? Did I do that? So it's it's that discipline part. If you find yourself rushing, be aware and try to stop yourself. If interrupted, here it is. Restart from the beginning is what they recommend. And then for me, I added on, this is my thing here, verbalize each time when doing it. Say it out loud. So I, I talk to myself. I teach my students to talk to themselves. I recommend everybody talk to yourself as a pilot. I do it in the simulator. I'll be like doing approaches in the sim and I talk to myself then too. So I find that that creates like a, it's another action that I'm taking and I kind of remember, oh yeah, I did say that. So it's like helps, helps my memory. So I highly recommend doing that. So treat, treat it like you're an airline crew, even though you're by yourself. Okay. We are coming to the end here. I know we got questions. We potentially have some ones we want to take a look at here. Um, so the AOPA app and pilot passport, Stephen, you are the expert on this. Do you want to give us the, uh, the rundown on what the folks can do with this? I don't know about being an expert, but you're definitely more of an expert than I am. <laughs> um, so yes, pilot passport is built into the AOPA app. Uh, it links into a bunch of information that includes our airport directory that we provide and maintain and gives you information and distance and all kinds of details about the different airports as you're traveling around. Passport program is kind of like the physical one that some states have where you can actually go to them and like pick up badges and check in at different locations. So it's kind of gamified a little bit like you can earn points and different badges for checking at different airports and our marketing folks do occasionally do some contests with this where you can win some prizes. So, so for this now Stephen, let me ask you a question. Is this the same as Wings Credit? It is not. This is something that we we are just doing to kind of keep it interesting and, and the interface fun. So this is this program, the AOPA app and Pilot Passport, and the code that's on this slide and on the next slide as well. Um, that is purely it's for fun. You might get some prizes out of it. I know Stephen, you've actually done this where you went around, and you were checking into different airports and building up that as you were uh, traveling and stuff. Um, so it's purely yeah. for fun might get yourself some points yeah and you might even win a prize but this is not wings credit not the wings credit for the wings credit Stephen, how about you tell us what do we need to do to get wings credit for this webinar at this point you do not need to do anything if you are registered for this webinar and you were here i will collect the attendee list at the end and be able to submit the emails to the faa to get the wings credit applied appropriately uh, i've got a liaison on the handles that for me the only hang up is going to make sure the email you use to register and watch our show today matches the one you use for your faa account otherwise i need to have an updated email from you so you can get credit properly so basically as long as you submitted your email that is from your faa account whether you use it to register or whether you just let us know about it you will get wings credit this is my favorite part these are my favorite kind of directions as a pilot i don't have to do anything i love it it's perfect. i will take care of it <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, and then we have, uh, here's our, uh, actually, let me just, I'll do the official end and then we'll go back to our, our uh, we'll come back to the slide to answer questions. So next episode coming up with Pablo, right? Where he is, he's committed here, um, July 21st, 2022. It's, uh, we're gonna have a special guest on to talk about flying into Oshkosh. Maybe some stories about flying into Oshkosh and how you can do it safely uh, if you wanna do that because Oshkosh, I believe it's the week after that, we're gonna be, uh, a mm -hmm. couple of us will be heading up that way uh, to mm -hmm. the show, so maybe we'll see some of you there. We did right, have a one. note, a request come in to do live from Osh, but I think we've got that, uh, the solution here is just before, so we'll get you prepped, ready to go, uh, but we will all be at Osh. You know, great note is that Chris, myself, Pablo, uh, will all be at Osh, so if anybody's going to be coming to the show, please stop by the AOPA uh, uh, campus and come see us. We're right uh, next to the Brown Arch. Right yeah, great to meet you guys. For sure. um, so that'll be that should be funny. We did talk about trying to do it on, and Pablo did test one. He did one uh, was a, a time or two ago. He actually we did a remote where he did it out of the hangar. We we're testing it. The Wi-Fi at Oshkosh is not so great, so True. that's why I really don't think that we would be able to to pull that off. We probably could do a pre-recorded one, but I don't think we could do a live broadcast from there very easily. And there's a fair bit of aircraft noise um, going around <laughs> up there. We, we deal with that a lot during seminars and meetings and things like that. But uh, I'm going to guess awesome. T6s might be in the background. They're, 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 yeah, the background. they're the ones that get you every time. <laughs> okay. So, Dan, do we have any questions that uh, that stuck out or that, that uh, we like to try to talk about here? Um, did you, in the handout, do you have the five Cs listed there? We did have a request to repeat that. Um, yes. If you could go through that. If it's not in the handout, if it is, great. But if not, that would be helpful. In the handout, they, they have the four C's in the handout. Oh, okay. I do the five C's. Um, 
in the handout, the four C's, I think they do everything that I have on here except for cool. So they do cram, climb, clean, call. Um, this was just one. And see, it's that it's this idea of primacy. I learned this when I was learning to fly the Seminole. And so because we had cow flaps, one of the things we did, which was open the cow flaps up when we were doing go arounds or um, is actually going missed approaches and things like that. So the, the fifth C that we do is cool. Cool the airplane or open the cow flaps. This works well if you're flying anything like a 182 or anything that's got cow flaps. So you can add in cool. We had a couple of notes about digital versus paper. Um, several people said they use ForeFlight, they love it um, for that, and others that really stick to the the paper chart. Any anything to add to that conversation? So whether to use digital versus paper charts? Yep, yep. Any sure. recommendations or, or tips or tricks for transitioning Absolutely. from one to the other? One thing I'll say before I, I will, I'm glad to talk about that. One thing I'll say too is in ForeFlight, one of the cool things that's built into it is there's a checklist uh, option, and they're not even an option. You can actually load up, and they've got for most of the standard aircraft, they've got a preloaded checklist you can use, and then you can actually edit it too to, to customize it for yourself. So that's really nice. So if you haven't seen the checklist thing to back up your flows, check it out in ForeFlight, go to the checklist. It's one of the little buttons. I think it's, if it's not showing up on your um, your iPad, it's like you kind of go to other and then it has checklist as one of the items. So for the paper thing, yeah, we get this question a lot. Um, this is something we talk about in the actual Rusty Pilots presentation, which we'll be doing on Monday at Oshkosh if you're up there and you want to do that. Um, hosted actually i think it's wednesday sorry wednesday i think it's wednesday morning we're doing rusty pilots so if you're if you're interested in that it's going to be i hear it's going to be an amazing presenter <laughs> anyway the uh the digital uh thing versus paper what i would say to you is i was one that when i came back as i i flew um in the the mid 2000s that's what i was doing all the professional stuff and then i had left flying you know sort of left not left flying but i went back to teaching and so oddly enough i couldn't afford to keep flying airplanes while i was a school teacher and when i came back i used all paper like when i was doing all my flying it was all paper before we had the digital stuff so when i came back i was very much one that as the digital stuff i was learning about it i was like well i still want to carry my paper charts with me as a backup um I've gotten to the point now where I still will, if I'm going on a flight, I will carry um, like a paper sectional and maybe paper and route charts. But the digital stuff is pretty darn good. Number one, it is, according to the FAA guidance, it is totally legal. It does account or it does count towards you having current charts by just using digital. The only thing that I do is it's like, I just want that again, I want redundancy if you haven't picked up on that theme. Um, and so, I will either have, like I'll have my iPad and I have my phone that I can use as a backup and then I carry the paper, but I've definitely slimmed down on the amount of paper that I carry. I don't carry a paper approach charts anymore for flying instruments. Sure. Instead, what I do is I will use the stuff in ForeFlight and then if I'm actually going to go fly an actual IFR um, or actual IMC, I should say, I will print out the charts um, just from like AOPA has got it in the airport director. You can print the charts out. And so I'll print out the ones from where I'm departing, where I'm going in my alternate. And I'll have those as paper backups. But otherwise, I've gotten used to using like uh, ForeFlight or, or any other EFB, whether it's like a Jeppesen one or something else. They've got it in there. It's, it's really convenient. So I recommend paper is a good backup. Probably want to carry this with you, but you can totally use digital. Sure. Good. Um, there was a question about transitioning from like the check do method to more of a flow check method. Any tips, tricks, suggestions, maybe do it incrementally? Yes. Well, that's a good question. I didn't think about uh, talking about that. Um, so I wish I could wish I could reach my poster over here. What I would say to you is the way you transition is to start, number one, figure out a flow that works. So it's like for the 172, please steal my flow that thing works really well for the 172 um and in fact i was even when i was looking at the seminal because it's been a while since i've flown multi but i was looking at the seminal and basically that flow works in the seminal because a lot of our ga aircraft have the fuel selector and stuff down here between the seats and then work our way up and around so you can kind of find a flow like that so number one develop your flow so look at the checklist what are the common things do you see a common path that could cover all these and and barring any system reason for why you might not want to do it in that order of the flow, you might be able to adopt it. Then the thing I would recommend to transition is to sit and practice in front of a poster or go sit in the airplane. Like if nobody's, if like the airplane's not being used, maybe you can go out and just sit in the cockpit and practice, but practice your flow and get it down. Because I think you'll find it won't really take all that long to transition. For my student pilots, when I'm training someone to fly, it's it's like generally I will teach them that flow right from the beginning by the, I'd say by the fifth flight, it's like they're getting familiar with what's on the checklist. And it's like, really just use your common sense, like fuel selector. 
where do you want it? Well, typically it's on, I want fuel on, right? So it's not like it's a big deal. And usually it's on both in most, you know, it's like, unless it's like a piper where you're flipping back and forth, left and right, it's just figure out, just use your common sense, the flaps. Well, where do I want the flaps to be? Normally they're up, right? Unless I'm coming into land and then I'm slowly putting them down. So what I would say is think, is there a flow that I can use? And then practice it and see if by doing it, you're catching all the things on the checklist. I bet you'll be able to do it within a couple of flights. It doesn't take very long, especially if you're familiar with the airplane. If you figured out a pattern to follow, I bet that you'll cover 99% of everything. You'll hardly ever miss stuff. It's usually the things I forget are things like latching the doors because it's not part of the flow or the seatbelt on the before landing checklist. I forget that most of the time just because it's, mm -hmm. it's not part of that flow that I do all the time. When um, when I did my primary training, and even if I come back to flying after not not going for a while, I like to actually go to the aircraft and sit in it uh, on the ground and not even firing anything up, but just to do a quick run through of the flows for each phase of flight. Um, that way, I've kind of got it in my, you know, it's back back up in my short term memory, and um, and I've got it refreshed and ready to go. So that was one, like I said, I use a lot for training, but still use it today from time to time after I haven't been flying is literally go sit in the aircraft and look at the instruments or touch the knob switch, whatever it is, uh, through that flow. Absolutely. In fact, I saw that Lith just threw a comment in here. He said, or the flow 172 pick. Absolutely. Get a picture of your aircraft. In fact, right. number one, if you're flying a standard, like a standard sort of outfitted check sporties they have those free posters they might have one for the model you're flying like definitely have the 172 i think they have a couple others as i recall and i think there's a 182 there may be a few others so check it out see if you can get a poster the other thing you can do is if you're airplane especially now that we're getting into a lot of people putting uh, g5s or other types of glass sort of starting to get rid of vacuum systems and things like that just get a good photo of it if you know of somebody that has a camera that can do that wide angle, see if mm. you can talk them into, you know, buy them, buy them lunch and see if they'll take a photo for you and you can get a, a poster printed out at some place like a Staples or some kind of office store. But get yourself that that picture and it's, it is good to have it big. Uh, that's what I found because I used to try to take pictures and look at small ones when I was in training and that didn't work as well having little photos, but having it blown up of some sort is a great way. So you can totally practice with that at home too. So yes, pictures are a great idea. No. Um, I'm looking through anything here quickly. Steven, anything jump out to you for questions? Hmm. So helping people out with a few of the technical things, if they want sure. to get copies of the slide well, deck. I got, yeah, keep looking guys. I got Joe here says any recommendations on checklist apps? Um, I don't necessarily, like, I can't say that since basically for me, I've just been using ForeFlight. We have we have printed checklists that we keep in the airplanes uh, that I will use too. But ForeFlight's got it built in. I'd say play with them. I bet a lot of them probably have some sort of demo or something you can go play with it. The things that I would look for that are nice is one feature is if you have something where you can automatically, um, it automatically has built into it the manufacturer checklist, that's a great time saver just so it's there. But the other part is being able to edit it so that you can customize and put little things in um, like that, so that'll, that'll sort of like, you can fit your flow in, especially if you wanna add things in. Don't take things away from the manufacturer checklist, but if you've got things you wanna add in to help you remember, add them in. Just be careful of adding too much stuff in, because mm -hmm. that can become um, un, you know, unusable. Yep, there are a fair amount of notes about, um, you know, one pager or small abbreviated checklist versus something that's custom made like that. So it seems to me like it's really, it's it's personal preference and what's gonna make you the safest yep. pilot, right? Absolutely. I like the one, I pray exactly, it is personal preference. I like the ones that are, um, in fact, I like the trifolds or the ones that are the sort of the flat. I don't like having to flip through stuff. Right. But, um, yeah, I do. I do prefer that. But that's, again, that's just my preference. Yep. Perhaps somebody said chair flying here. You can mention here, uh, it's Kay. Hey, Kay. Um, it said chair flying and then putting the ground power units. You can often do that at a school or a place like that where they'll mm -hmm. have a place where you can plug the battery and you can sit there and actually mess with the avionics. Also, somebody mentioned about, remember that question we had a while ago about the avionics. Um, like if you, a Garmin I know does it, I imagine the other manufacturers do it, but get their simulator yeah. and play with it. And that way you can really, because that's the best way to learn the avionics. It's often hard to learn new avionics while you're flying, you're busy. So it's better to sit on the ground or if you can get a sim to do it, that's a great way to do it too. Um, so just highly recommend doing doing it that way. The other thing, this is something that I'm in the process of doing right now for, um, we're trying to, to build out an instrument rating, some guidance. And the thing that I would mention here too is come up with a task list. What is it you want to be able to do with this set of avionics uh, so that you can, um, you know, so you can figure out what you can 
sort of hone in your training. So figure it out. And the FAA even had a document um, that I found. It was part of their FITS program, F-I-T-S, Foxtrot India Tango Sierra, uh, that had some, some generic sort of task list. That's a good way to go about when you're doing with advanced avionics, like a GPS. All right, we have anything else? I think that was a good a good grab of everything out there. So that's one person. Let me just see where they I see Robert. No, uh, what is the one I'm looking at here? Oh, somebody's asking if they can use the uh, the AOPA app on uh, the commercial airlines. I think so. I don't know if you can. You could probably do it while you're in the airplane, like on the ground. I think you actually have to be Stephen. You could help with that with that the AOPA pilot as pilot passport thing. Um, that's something ah. that it's like to get proximity to the airport it triggers, right? Yes, you have to be within, I believe it's three miles of the airport for it to pick it up and let you check in. It does work on commercial airlines. I've tried it. Okay. And by the and way, it, anybody it does work flying over run? too. It's, there you go. Um, I see some some people saying like they're checking in. Like if you know, you're officially done, if you're looking for wings credit, you're good to go. Don't worry about having to hang around. We're just they're just answering questions for folks that have them. Um, so somebody says final walk around, checking chocks. That's a good idea on pre-flight. I totally agree. Uh, that's David saying that. Yeah, Using no. the go ahead. You may, you may have covered this. It was a comment earlier on. It was um, what is your recommendation about memory triggers? I sometimes forget to do something at some points during the flight. I know I have to attach a checklist to triggers. Cool. Oh yeah. Checklist, but sometimes I forget. So here's my recommendation for that. There's two triggers that I use. The number one trigger is things like. I'm changing the flight in the sense of like, I'm taking off, now I'm climbing, now I'm leveling, now I'm descending. Those are my triggers. Anytime I'm getting out of whatever phase of flight I'm in, I know that I'm about to start descending or even turning, I use those. The other one, and this is what I learned the hard way, um, which is if you find yourself chilling out and kind of going like, oh, I'm just kind of fat, dumb and happy flying along, you should be doing a flow. Because that's the times when I've had electrical failures and things like that that I didn't catch is because I was fat, dumb and happy, not paying attention. So what I do is I am constantly trying to be vigilant while I'm flying. Where am I going? What's my heading? What's coming up next? Always thinking what's next. And anytime I have a moment during cruise, I'm looking around, I'm checking where would I land if I needed to land and I run a flow. Because the things that especially you want to check during cruise are your engine instruments and your electrical system. Because those are the two things that are, are going to cause you trouble and you want to monitor. So it's like, how am I doing fuel-wise? How am I doing with my electrical? Is my electrical system working properly? And then are the engines working the way they should be? Do I have any, any indications that I should worry about? So Because if you monitor that better, you can deal with things as they start to happen versus like all of a sudden it got so bad that it's now bringing your attention to it. Try to catch the little deviations early and you can deal with them in a much less dramatic matter. And I'm telling you that from experience, <laughs> having had three electrical failures, those are the major things that I've dealt with. Uh, and the first time was because I just was too busy. I was instructing or whatever, and I was not paying attention to the system. So that, that drilled into my head, look at your systems, monitor them. So if you find yourself chilling, nothing to do, it's time to do a flow. Good. So I'm not sure if, Chris, you saw it, but the Guess Where Dan is From contest, we have a winner. Uh, yes. That. People <laughs> got dialed in pretty quickly. It started with Canada, uh, but then <laughs> moved around the Midwest. Um, and, and to be fair, um, the answer was Wisconsin. I'm from Heartland, Wisconsin. And uh, I know my O's uh, always seem to sell it, but some of those guys in Minnesota, and to their credit, uh, after college in Wisconsin, I did move up to Minneapolis and lived there for several years. So I think it's a hybrid, but uh, one thing <laughs> wow. the accent has not left me, though I've left the Midwest a long time ago. It's, it's, I have to say, Dan, it is kind of subtle, but it, you definitely you can hear it. And it's only because I, I like to, for me, it's fun to pay attention to that it's kind the of stuff. O's. Definitely the O's. It's the O's, the bullet, <laughs> don't you know? Oh, sure. Um, Here's one some person asking me, Luis is asking, what's your take on a one page or abbreviated checklist? I prefer those as easier to reference in flight. Oh yeah, that's we already answered that one, I think. Mm. We talked about that. Okay. Some people mentioned electronic checklists, like this for flight have something like that where you can kind of go through and it's yes. that we have a record too that if you miss something. Yeah, the, the one in four flight and other ones like it too. There are electronic ones, a separate app. I, I only use four flight because I'm happy to, I'm using it during flight and it happens to be built into it, so that's convenient. But yeah, they on a lot of those types, they're cool because you can actually check the item off as you do it. And then it's a really easy thing where you then just reset to clear it um, to do the next part. So it's a nice record that you actually did accomplish it. So that's kind of cool. All right. All right. 
Uh, let's see, do we have any other questions coming in? Looks like folks are getting going. So yeah, thanks. We appreciate you there, Ned. Um, and then Brian, so paper checklist while in the pattern. Yeah, so it's uh, so the, uh, we kind of talked about this, but Brian was asking, uh, my instructor told me not to use paper checklist while in the traffic pattern. So what I would say to you is use flows, keeping your eyes outside. Yes, the flows are good to keep you more heads up. So what I say is, again, the point is a first landing in the pattern do the checklist just so you're reinforcing the habit because it's really easy to get in the habit of not doing that so i would recommend just do it the first time so you've got the habit i'm getting ready to land i did my checklist after that then i agree just do flows after that for especially in a simple airplane you may change your mind depending on how complicated the aircraft is. you've got retractable gear you might want more of a backup to make sure those gear go down um, so anyway and then somebody says what was the reference within three miles of the airport i think that was for the aopa passport app of when you can get close. Yes, happy 4th of July to you too, George. And I think that's it. Uh, yes, everybody will get credit. The webinar is officially over. Um, and I see, like, I think we're kind of wrapping things up. So we appreciate everybody being here. Thanks, Dan, for filling in. Um, I know everybody missed Pablo, but I think they enjoyed the Wisconsin accent. <laughs> oh, the blast. This was really fun. And I know I have no Pablo, but, uh, you know, I gave it the old college try. So uh, <laughs> now you, I appreciate we, we the opportunity. Appreciate it's really here. fun to be here with everybody. <laughs> that was fun. And Stephen, thank you for helping us out too. And I tell you what, let's go ahead. Let's wrap it up. Let's take it away and look for this online. And we'll see you next time. July, whoops, real quick, just the last 21st. mention, July 21st, talking about Oshkosh. Oshkosh. Oh, gosh, Oshkosh. Sorry, I screwed that up. Whatever. Oh, 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 oh gosh. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> All right.